Director is the Chief Trial Counsel for Pima County, Arizona, Arizona Attorney's Office. As Chief Trial Counsel, he prosecutes homicides, cold cases, violent felonies, sexual assaults, and crimes against children in Tucson. He lectures at the Arizona Prosecuting Attorney Advisory Council, statewide training seminars, and has also been a lecturer for the National District Attorneys Association. He has been awarded the Arizona Prosecuting Attorney Advisory Council, David R. White, Excellence in Victim Advocacy Award in August 2009, and APACC Felony Prosecutor of the Year in August of 2011. Uh, before he became a prosecutor, Jonathan spent eight years in private practice specializing in environmental litigation with the Los Angeles offices of two international law firms, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher and Lathan and Walker, Watkins. In 2003, he wrote A Pound of Cause for a Penny of Proof, The Failed Economy of the Eroded Causation Standard in Toxic Tort Cases, wow. whatever that means. <laughs> Published in the New York University Environmental Law Journal, in his free time to scare, scare criminal cases out of his mind, he climbs rocks. Very interesting gentleman. Uh, he's, his topic today is how not to get away with murder, an insider's view of cold case prosecutions. And I promise you, this is gonna be very interesting. Jonathan. Can we hit the lights there so you all can see the slides? The, I think if we get the front, there we go. Thank you very much, Polly. It's an honor to be here. Uh, as Polly mentioned, I'm the Chief Trial Counsel at the Pima County Attorney's Office. And as she mentioned, that means that I try major violent felonies, sex assaults, child abuse types of cases. I've been doing that for um, coming up on 15 years now. And uh, let me tell you just briefly a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up uh, kind of being a high school debate type and reading the paper about things that, that happened to people that were, that were wrong and shouldn't happen, you know, violent crimes. And I know it sounds kind of dorky or unbelievable, but even in junior high school, I remember thinking, I wanna use my oratorical skills, my skills that I, that I have uh, from debate team and go into the courtroom and go after you know people who have done done wrong and and try to hold them accountable. So that was a dream of mine from when I was uh, young. I went to Iowa Law School. I graduated in 1994 and came to Arizona. I, I definitely didn't want to live through another Iowa winter. So I came out to Arizona and clerked for uh, Vice Chief Justice James Moeller of the Arizona Supreme Court, and um, spent a year doing that. And it was a wonderful year, learned a lot about Arizona criminal law and civil law, but I got a little sidetracked because if you're clerking at the Arizona Supreme Court, you're working with all the other recent law school graduates who are all going off to big fancy law firms and they're gonna make a lot of money, right? And it sounded important. And, I, and the Maricopa County Attorney's Office where I had envisioned starting as a prosecutor had a hiring freeze. And so I went and worked for a little firm in Phoenix for a year and I was absolutely bored out of my mind doing civil law. <laughs> nothing, nothing against those of you, anybody who practices civil law here or practice <laughs> civil law. I, I, I don't mean to, to criticize, but it just wasn't for me. Uh, however, I, I realized I could go work for, a, for big LA law firms and, and I thought this was super exciting and, and fancy. And I mean, honestly, you make a lot of money doing that. And, uh, and I, and I kind of, my dream got derailed or sidetracked for a little while. <laughs> specifically eight years, because I was in LA working for two major law firms for eight years. And that's a whole nother story. I did have uh, some interesting things to do and, and learned a lot, but ultimately I realized I was never going to 
hold an offender accountable. I was never going to walk into trial and try my own case. I mean, I worked on cases that were so big, they were 15 years still in the discovery process. We would have 80 plus lawyers working on a single case. You're not just going to waltz into trial and try one of these cases. And, um, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And I actually wanted to do something that mattered. So in 2005, I took a pay cut. And I'm not good at math. I don't know if it's, is it, it's not 400%. It's a, it's a pay cut where I, I came here to be a prosecutor and made 25% of what I had been making. Oh. I mean, my bonus the year I left Gibson was the same as my salary as a prosecutor. So you're not doing what I'm doing for the money, okay? But I was lucky. Uh, I, was, I was able to just decide that making money wasn't what life was about. And I, and I wanted to do something that mattered. And that thing for me is helping my community go after people who have done bad, you know? And I wanna to talk to you about a couple uh, cases. And um, I'm gonna go through them kind of quickly because they're both pretty big <laughs> cases and either one we could talk about for a while. So, uh, but that being said, because I'm gonna move kind of quickly through each of these stories, and I find them both fascinating stories and I hope you will as well, but I want to encourage you to make me slow down, ask questions, have me uh, clarify things as we're going through the slides. Since we got a, a small enough group here that we can have a discussion, right? We can, we can ask questions and, and uh, I, I don't know, to encourage that, what if I just, it's a little hot here. Do you guys mind if I take off my jacket? Is that okay? Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. It, it, it's a bit warm, but but uh, I'm really glad you're here, and, and I think uh, you'll find these stories interesting. So uh, the first case I want to talk to you about is is the David Watson case, and David Watson was a firefighter here in Pima County in Tucson, worked for Tucson Fire Department, and he literally got away with murder, three murders, for years, for over a decade. Uh, this is a picture of David Watson with his daughter Jordan and his second wife Rosemary and um, this this was taken at their wedding which occurred in June of 2000 now two of the three ladies in this picture would end up dead while they're fighting David Watson for custody of the child in the picture that's Jordan Watson his mm -hmm. daughter so this is Linda Watson and Marilyn Cox, Linda's mother. And Linda was, if we go back to this picture, this is Rosemary Watson, uh, David's second wife. Linda was David's first wife and the mother of Jordan. And Linda and David got married in the mid 90s, but they had a pretty brutal divorce uh, in the late 90s. And this is a, a, a document that was an exhibit at trial. It's a list of all the filings in their, in their divorce proceedings, but it was nasty. And um, it, even after the divorce issues were finalized, the custody issues were not. And into the time frame of the summer of 2000, that wedding, wedding picture again to Rosemary, that's uh, June of 2000. August of 2000, so just a couple months after Rosemary marries David, uh, Linda and David are going to court and fighting over custody of Jordan. And that battle, that, that custody battle was bitter. How bitter? David Watson's own mother was going to testify against him at a hearing in late August of 2000, saying that Linda deserved custody of Jordan. And um, if we take a look at the timing of the hearing, Linda was going to go to court and battle for custody of Jordan August 24th, which was a Thursday. And that Sunday preceding, preceding the Thursday, was the last time anybody ever saw Linda alive. Now, Linda's disappearance had some indications that it was not a simple missing persons case. I, I don't know if you know this, missing persons calls happen quite frequently, surprisingly frequently. Mm -hmm. And almost always, the police are able to locate the missing person. They come back. Um, and usually it's 24, 48 hours, they come back. So just because you call and say, my loved one's not home, will not launch a CSI level investigation necessarily. And what happened here is that Linda's 
disappearance on Monday morning, um, she had workers be, workers coming over to the house because work was being done on her house. She lived on Curtis Road um, in, in Tucson. And obviously she was found missing. She had plans for that morning to meet up with a friend. And, and so people were worried about her. And specifically her mom, Marilyn Cox, was convinced from the get-go something was wrong because her nice Jeep Cherokee is sitting in the driveway so she didn't drive off. There's a broken coffee mug. Now here you're seeing it in the kitchen, but it was actually found by that worker who came over that morning and he moved it to the kitchen, but there was a broken coffee mug in the entryway of Linda's house. Her uh, pager and Bible, which she would, she would take the pager with her. This was especially important to us at trial to show that you know she had been murdered because she would take that pager with her when she did not have Jordan because she and David were splitting custody and she didn't have Jordan with her at this time. And so the pager being in the house was another indication that uh, you know criminal activity was afoot, that something bad happened to Linda. But um, like I say, typical missing person response is, well, let us know if she doesn't show up. Let us know in 48 hours if she's still not back. And what happened is there's that custody hearing going on on Thursday the 24th. Of course, Linda's not there. She's dead. Uh, and so David shows up at the custody hearing, and he gets everything he wants. He gets custody of Jordan, an end to child support payments, which were hefty, and an end to the fight with Linda. So that Thursday, while he's in court getting everything he wants because Linda is gone, Marilyn, Linda's mother, May she rest in peace and bless her heart. She was, she was a fighter and you'll hear about this, but, but she basically was, she was gonna move into her daughter's house and be there until she came back. She was gonna find out what happened to her daughter. But I, I, I said something to the jury in this case and I'll say it to you. A mother knows, she knew something was wrong. And so on that Thursday, the same day that David's down in court winning because Linda is gone, Marilyn moves a bag, this bag, this garbage bag. It was full of clothes because they were remodeling the house. They had a lot of stuff from different rooms stuffed into bags. And this, clo this bag of clothes happened to be from Jordan's room, but it was sitting in the front entryway. And Marilyn was cleaning up and she moved the bag. And she found that it was on the bottom covered in blood. And there was blood on the floor underneath the bag. And what you should know about this, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about CSI and what TV might give you as far as a misimpression about forensic evidence, but we're gonna be talking about some real life forensic evidence. That blood is what's called transfer. And somebody who's expert in, in blood spatter and, and, and um, looking at crime scenes will know that right away. And those types of experts will tell you that what that means is that the blood did not pool under the bag where Marilyn picked it up and moved it. Rather, it had sat in pooled blood somewhere else and gotten blood on the bottom of that bag mm -hmm. and then moved to this location which transferred the blood on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that significant? Because this is the area where Marilyn moved the bag and specifically, let me see if I can point it to you guys. The bag was right here, okay, where she moved it. Mm -hmm. And you, you can see it's not like blood is, is, is leaping out to the naked eye, right? And so that's why Marilyn hadn't noticed it for, for days until she moved that bag. But what that transfer tells you, because there had to be a pool of blood that that bag had to sit in, it tells you that the killer, well, it tells you that Linda bled a lot in that front entryway because it was later tested and determined to be Linda's DNA. Uh, but it also tells you that the killer cleaned up which, you know, and, and, and what does that tell you? That tells you that the killer was comfortable enough staying in the house, because that's, that's a lengthy cleanup. Um, and, and, and that tells you something about the murder. Now, there's the floor uh, as police are processing the scene. To the naked eye, you know, what do you see? Do you see blood? It's, it's pretty hard to see blood there. That's the floor when you use luminol to look for the presence of blood. So not everything is vis visible to the naked eye, although we had some pretty good shots that you could zoom in 
and mm -hmm. see once you knew what you were looking for, you could see there was some visible blood there. And just to give an example, and I know this is gonna be hard to see from the back. Uh, maybe I can zoom in a little bit here. Uh, on that vacuum cleaner cord, that vacuum was sitting in the front entryway, and that cord was coated in blood in a uniform. Can you guys see this in the back? Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's like a uniform pattern here. Yeah. That's not spatter. That cord sat in pooled blood, and then the cord was wrapped around the vacuum cleaner and put away. So again, that tells us, Linda, this, this was, uh, oh my goodness, what have I done? Let's see, um, get back to the slides here. That tells us that Linda bled a whole bunch in that, in that front entryway. And you know, that I'll tell you uh, again, something that we also talk about with the jury in these types of cases, there are a lot of unsolvable mysteries about Linda's death. And ultimately we could not charge David Watson with premeditated first degree murder because ethically, how can I do that when I don't know what happened? Did Linda, did David come over to the house to argue about the hearing? and then they had an uh, 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 argument and a fight, and perhaps he did not premeditate the killing but ended up killing her, we just don't know. So, so he was ultimately charged with second degree murder of, of Linda. Now, to just zero in on the timeline, it's pretty suspicious, isn't it? That Linda goes missing the night that David drives over to his mother's house and says, Mom, please, don't testify against me. And mom says, no, I'm gonna testify. I mean, she, she believed that Linda was the person who should have custody of Jordan and she was gonna testify against him. And that conversation did not go well. Linda then within hours makes her last call. You know, that's the last anybody hears of Linda and everything is fine with her. I mean, she was struggling with, to, not to get into too much detail, but she was struggling with sobriety and she was talking on the phone with a sponsor that night, but she was not, suicidal or despondent and we had a, i bring this up because we had a lot of arguments about this at trial whether this was somehow suicide now you tell me how you commit suicide and then clean up all your own blood i don't these are the kind of arguments i, I that we get um, pretty routinely down in the courthouse so in any event linda was not um, despondent her sponsor testified at the trial and he said no her plan was to um, take a bath and go to bed and we were going to meet in the morning so the next morning, Linda's gone, the custody hearing happens on the 24th, and that same day Linda's blood is found, and David, like I said, gets everything he wants at subsequent court hearings, custody, property, into child support. Now, you might, we press pause there and you say, goodness gracious, Mosier, you tried the case then, right? I mean, because that, that sounds like a pretty decent case. Well, here's why it wasn't a viable case at all. Um, Rosemary married David in June of 2000 and she was in love and I want to challenge you all the way I challenged the jury at the trial you know before you judge Rosemary as we go through this story think about walking in her shoes this was the man she loved she had just married him this is the honeymoon phase folks and it is pretty hard to wrap your mind around the fact that the man you love snuck out of bed at night, went over and slaughtered his ex-wife. So what happened is that Rosemary woke up during the night, Dave was gone. She woke up again, he was coming home, and she asked him where he had been, and he said he went for a walk to clear his mind. And although it's highly suspicious circumstances, Rosemary ultimately testified at trial and explained she believed him. She wanted to believe him. And in, t in the 2000 time frame, she really did believe him. I mean, she was, she was convincing him. I hate to spoil the end of the story, but David Watson was convicted of all the murders I'm going to be talking about. And so the jury believed Rosemary, ultimately. Um, however, at this time, that means that Rosemary was David's alibi. So she said she didn't want to cause problems for him when he would be blamed for a murder that he didn't commit because again ha it's her husband it's the man she loves of course he's not guilty of murder so i'm just gonna help him with the police and just say he was home all night and that's what she did so years went by and what happened in those years again bless her heart marilyn marilyn was a fighter so marilyn decided at first she didn't know who had done it because Linda had an ex-boyfriend uh, 
and so she was somewhat focused on him, but ultimately, within a few months, she became convinced it was David Watson that had killed her daughter. And she was going to do a couple of things. One, maintain contact with Jordan, her, her last you know, uh, memory or, or living memory of, of her daughter, right? I mean, her granddaughter. She was going to fight like a mama bear to, to make sure she still had visitation with, with her granddaughter. And then she was also gonna expose David Watson for being a killer. And I, I don't just mean that theoretically. She was writing letters to the sheriff's office, to the county attorney's office, telling us that she knew that David Watson had killed her daughter. But again, there is an alibi. So what happens is that Marilyn fights David Watson and Rosemary, who's on his side at this time frame, right? Uh, Marilyn fights them in court for, for visitation rights. It's now it's not custody, it's grandparent visitation. And actually it was pretty groundbreaking stuff. Uh, Marilyn obtained court orders and a victory in court after literally years of fighting. David Watson had to spend $60,000 in legal bills to resist grandparent visitation. And I, I get the sense, I could be wrong, I get the sense we have one or two grandparents in the room. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I think that. You got, uh, but but I, you know, I know this is true in my family, is that the grandparents help with the kids. Have you ever heard anybody spend 60 grand to, to fight against getting help with the kids? My goodness gracious, we all love our kids, but at a certain point you need some help, right? So that was uh, pretty interesting how hard David fought. And we'll come back to that later because he, he talked to police eventually about why he fought so hard. It's because Marilyn was telling everybody in the world that he had killed Linda, and it was only a matter of time before she was going to tell Jordan that, that David had killed her mother. So this is Renee Farnsworth. She was a neighbor of Marilyn Cox who had moved into Linda's house. So the same house that you saw the pictures of the, of the blood on the floor, Marilyn's now living there. And Marilyn, while fighting David, be, is, and, and while, while believing in her heart that, that David is a, is a killer, she's scared too. She's scared, but not scared enough to stop what she's doing. She gets a gun, she keeps it by the bed. She takes a friend with her if she's gonna have to deal with David. And the reason she has to deal with him is because until she wins after a three-year battle, the right to unsupervised visitation, the only thing she got was supervised visits. So she would be going back and forth with David and Rosemary to see Jordan from time to time. But those were supervised, meaning David and Rosemary could be there. Uh, and she wanted to be able to see Jordan on her own. So Renee was somebody, uh, and there were other people too, who Marilyn would take with her when she had to interact with David because the way she put it was there's strength in numbers. She never, in her wildest dreams, I don't think Marilyn or Renee thought that they were putting Renee in any danger because they did not think that David Watson would be so callous as to kill an a, a innocent woman who had no involvement in any of this just to eliminate a witness. So what happens is we have years of a visitation battle from January of 2001 when Marilyn first petitions the court for visitation rights all the way through till April 2003. In January of 2003, she the battle should have been over then. She won. The court said, you get unsupervised visitation. But she still had to fight to get David to comply with that. In April of 2003, she took him back to court and she won the right to have unsupervised visitation. So as a motion to enforce the previous order, she wins, visitation is ordered, and it's going to happen. And it's gonna happen on a specific day, and David Watson reschedules it. And that's interesting because he reschedules it to an evening where he makes plans to attend a fireman's union meeting. Now, if you're gonna, if you're gonna kill somebody, if you're gonna be there, <coughs> you're not gonna have an alibi because you're gonna be at the scene of the murder. But it was always our theory of the case that the next best thing to have in an alibi is being somewhere right before and may, being somewhere right after and having people be able to say, well, I saw him at the firemen's union meeting right before that. So that's, you know, I don't know, but, I, but that, that appears to be what the plan was mm -hmm. on David Watson's part. Because mm -hmm. what happens is that that day where visitation was ordered, Renee and Marilyn went to take Jordan home after the visit. 
and it's about eight in the evening and, and they drop Jordan off with Rosemary and D David's at the firemen's union meeting where by the way he left early and people saw him leave and it was exactly enough time that he could get up to the Curtis Road address and when Marilyn and Renee drove home from dr dropping off Jordan a lone man he was observed by two guys two two neighborhood guys and uh, they both described about six feet tall medium build I mean this is this is David Watson who they're describing uh, a lone gunman popped out gunned them both down and took off across the street and got away and if you guys have, have any of you ever driven down Curtis Road it's um, you know it's busy enough to where I wouldn't say it's um, you know a major thoroughfare but it's busy enough to where that takes some real um, boldness because he just ran right across that street you know these two neighborhood guys saw him taken off across the street and I mean if there had been a car coming and they would have got a good look at him in the headlights or anything it was just a very bold act um, but no what's left behind again just like Linda's Jeep Cherokee in 2000 the car the purse I mean folks I it's um, kind of a sad view of the world but I my steady diet of my job is murder, okay? And, uh, and I deal with a lot of murders. If there's a homicide in Tucson, I get a call, and either myself or somebody on my team goes out to it. So, and there, uh, there are a significant amount of homicides in Tucson and Pima County. Luckily, not so many in your beautiful part of the world down here, right? Uh, but this stands out. This is unusual to have purse and car left behind, to have, you know, an assassination like this is, is unusual. So what happens? I mean, obviously the prime suspect would be David Watson, right? By this point, you know, of course, the first thing that happens that night is the police go over and knock on his door and talk to him. But uh, Rosemary is still on his side. Now, he leaves that union meeting about 8 p.m. About 8.30, Marilyn and Renee drop off Jordan, which, which means, it's gonna take them about 12 minutes to drive over to Curtis Road. And sure enough, 8.48 p.m. we get the 911 call. And then about 9 p.m. David Watson arrives home, sweaty, pale, panicked, except that that's not what Rosemary tells the police back in 2003. What she tells the police in 2003 is that he was home all night. He comes home and makes a call to a friend. Hey, you want to go horseback riding tomorrow? This was interesting because the friend said, he never really called me at nine at night to go horseback riding the next day. Uh, but he did that night. And that's what I'm talking about, about making sure that people know where you are right before and right after. If you're, if you're going to have to be at the crime scene, you know. So after the shooting, we do get some good evidence. I don't mean to tell you just because Rosemary what, you know, was an alibi that everybody just said, oh, okay, Rosemary, he was at home. I mean, they were still investigating this and they found some good evidence in uh, the summer of, of 2003. Uh, first of all, interview with David Watson, which ultimately we played at trial years later and which uh, included him describing that he absolutely positively could not have Marilyn telling Jordan that he killed her mother. Uh, we get a money clip, which is David Watson's initials on it, DDW, David Dwayne Watson, found in the backyard of the Curtis Road residence about two weeks after the murder. And the interesting thing about that is, remember how I said the divorce was so antagonistic with Linda? He wouldn't have been welcome over there or staying over there or had been in the backyard for years by this time. And then the other thing is that he just happened to have a gun that was consistent with the murder weapon, which he just happened to have gotten rid of and couldn't tell us who he sold it to. He said, I took out an ad in the paper. I don't know who I sold it to. So, and I'll skip, I, I, we got a lot to go through. I'm gonna skip this clip, but this is a clip we played at trial of David Watson saying, I couldn't have Marilyn talking about how I killed Jordan's mother. Um, there's the money clip that was found in the backyard. It does not look like a money clip that had been laying there for years in the weather, right? And again, no reason he would have been back there. Now you might ask, uh, why, would, why would his money clip be in the backyard? So if he's, if he's staging, if he's waiting for them to show up and he's gonna ambush Marilyn and Renee, he doesn't wanna stay in the front yard because like I say, Curtis Road is busy enough, you don't wanna be out there. If he's in the back, and he knew 
he knew this property because he had lived there in the, in the earlier in the 90s. Uh, if he's in the backyard, and, and he's a smart guy, I mean, th as far as, like I say, this is not kind of the, the usual homicide that we see. This is somebody who's pretty intent on getting away with it. So is he putting on gloves? Is he getting the gun out of his pocket? Something happens where something, you know, the money clip falls out of his pocket, unbeknownst to him. And here's just a, uh, this is, if you, can you guys see that pointer? This is where, uh, this is the driveway where, where Marilyn and Renee were, were, were killed. And this is where the money clip is found out here by this guest house. So there's the bullet, um, one of the bullets that was, this was a bullet from, from uh, the victim's body. And the reason that's important is because you can take a bullet and you can measure it. And you guys can see these lands and grooves here. A, a, a barrel is rifled to, make, to impart spin, just like a football when you throw it, you want it to spin so it'll be accurate. Mm -hmm. And that, those lands and grooves that impart spin to a bullet, they can be measured. And we can look at that, we can enter that into a database, and what we come up with is 127 hits of different firearms. There's, there's a lot of firearms out there, folks. And this database will tell us, it's called a General Rifling Characteristic Database. It'll tell us, well, there's 127 guns that could do this. However, a lot of those guns are very unusual. There, some of them are, are actually rifles. Uh, not handguns, and we had witnesses who, who did not see a weapon in the, in the shooter's hand right after the shooting, so, so in other words, he had a handgun because nobody saw a long rifle. On the list is a Ruger P85. I know you can't see that well from where you're at, but that's just to give you an idea of the list. A Ruger P85, that's the weapon. David Watson had one, and we dug through the ATF files and found this is his signature buying that Ruger P85 that he said he got rid of, but he couldn't, couldn't tell the police who he sold when it to. When did he buy it? Uh, 1989. Yeah, so, so long before this. Um, so 2003, some really good evidence, right, in terms of the, the firearm and the money clip, but Rosemary is saying he was at home all night. There's no viable case. And I don't know if that's upsetting to people or if they, you know, I mean, they, yes, sir. Can't they do a uh, lie detector test on that one? Well, so that's a really good question. Um, the lie detector test is inadmissible in court. It is used sometimes for investigation purposes. Um, you know, it never, even if it indicated that Rosemary was being dishonest, which is basically what police thought at the time, it wouldn't have been any kind of admissible evidence or evidence that we could act upon. So it's, yeah, a lie detector could be done and basically I guess what I'm saying is it would have told the detective what he already knew at that time, which is he thought Rosemary was lying to him, but he didn't really have a way of, of shaking loose the truth. He tried to, this detective, by the way, his name is Paul Montano. He did an outstanding job in his interviews in this case. So his interview with David Watson gave us critical motive evidence and I'm gonna talk some more about other interviews he did which were thorough, exhaustive. He spent a lot of time with Rosemary trying to get her to tell us the truth. When the lie detector test, what addition he and her to offer up in terms of information? You know, your question is, can you use a lie, a lie detector strategically to try to get her to give additional information? Right. And the answer is, that does happen, absolutely. It's one, it's one uh, arrow in the quiver but you know, don't don't take away the sense that that's that's always the approach. Um, you know, a good detective doing lengthy interviews and repeated interviews, like was done here, um, can sometimes jar something loose. Whereas if you come at somebody with a polygraph, I guess what I'm getting at is sometimes you get more bees with honey, and they were hopeful that maybe Rosemary would come forward, which she eventually did. It took years. She stood by David Watson for years, and I don't expect you guys to be able to see this from here, and this is actually, you, with the other stuff I'm showing you, you're gonna wonder why we have a sloppy little handwritten chart. I want you to know something about this. This tool I'm using, um, we use trial pad with an iPad with a wireless um, setup in the courtroom, and we try to be real visual in our trials because jurors expect it these days, right? They expect CSI, forensic evidence, a visual trial, and that's something I really believe strongly in, in helping the jury through. What you'll see a lot of times, and I don't know if it's strategic or just how it works, but what you'll see a lot of times then is that the defense lawyer 
will get out the big old paper and pad. And they'll say, hey, you know, Mr. Mosher's so fancy with all of his fancy gadgets. Let me just talk to you nice people like a real person and they'll use the chart. And so I, I also need to use the chart too, in case some people find that a better way of learning. You know, it just depends on what, whether you're a visual learner, whether you like the chart and words on the chart. So I, I had, so this is actually an exhibit from the trial where we hand wrote out the timeline and sequence of events as we were going through it with a very dear friend of Rosemary Watson. And the reason is because this dear friend saw what Rosemary went through. And what she went through was, she was in love, and then after uh, Marilyn is shot, Dave has an affair, which, I mean, we can pause right there. If this is your alibi witness on three murders, <laughs> that's not the smartest uh, activity, right? In fact, she's so mad at him for cheating on her that she confronts him in a bar and slaps him in the face and she gets arrested for domestic violence for, for, um, for that um, little dust up in a bar. Uh, she had a run in with the, with the lady as well that he was with at the time. Um, she still defends him publicly after all of the cheating and her getting actually booked in jail for domestic violence. She still stands by him. And the reason I point that out, that was important for the jury because scared, not scorned. Why did Rosemary come forward? Did she come forward because she's a bitter woman who's being divorced from Dave and therefore comes forward? Because what happens is, is that fast forward several years in, in um, the spring of 2007, Rosemary and Dave have split. And now they're dealing with custody problems as far as exchanges of the kids and who's going to have a kid when. And Dave now has a new girlfriend who is, by the way, a little unusual, his best friend's daughter. Oh. And uh, so Rosemary's bothered by that because this is a little girl that she had known growing up, like from when she was a little girl, okay? And now she was of legal age, but it was still gave her a bad feeling, so they were having arguments about that. And in that context, Rosemary said something challenging Dave on one of these child exchanges, and David took off his sunglasses. They were sitting in the front of the truck. David in the driver's seat takes off his sunglasses, looks at Rosemary and says, don't F with me, Rosemary. And Rosemary described pretty vividly that that caused her to have like insight that not only had this guy killed before, but he would kill her. I mean, obviously it had been fermenting in her mind. And when that incident happened, she realized, oh, he is a killer. And what happened is, is and we had to call a number of witnesses at trial who saw Rosemary during this time period to add to her credibility because these were people who saw her literally like hyperventilating, vomiting sick. Not even David described her as, as, as physically ill um, in, during some of these time periods. And, and so the fact is, is that Rosemary didn't know what to do and she commiserated with her friend, who's the witness, Jessica it says at the top of this, that was um, Rosemary's friend who was testifying about all this. Rosemary commiserated with Jessica and Jessica basically said, if you don't go to the police, I'm going to the police. You have to go to the police. And so Rosemary did go to the police in June of 2007 and told him the real story, which is that in August of 2000, the night Linda was murdered, David was not home. She woke up twice during the night, once just noticed he was gone, and then again closer to dawn woke up and saw him unloading items from the Jeep. She never did say, oh, I saw him unload a shovel. We think he probably had been out burying her and we'll talk about where in a bit but uh, but she did she didn't say I saw him unloading a shovel or a pick or anything like that but just I saw him unloading the Jeep and he came inside carrying a box of gloves like a paramedic would would have he was a he was a firefighter paramedic in 2003 Rosemary said Dave had gone to the union meeting and came home about nine o'clock sweaty pale panicked came in gave Jordan a kiss good night and then said, um, you gotta wash my clothes, and took off his clothes and gave them to Rosemary, jumped in the shower. He was visibly shaken before the shower. He came out calm, cool, and collected, and called Tom Camp, his friend, to go horseback riding. And the thing you gotta know about David Watson, he had a nickname, actually had two nicknames at the fire department. We could not touch on this at, at, at trial, at court, but, but just so you know, he was um, known as Coma, 
was one nickname because he was so flatlined. He, you know, a paramedic for the fire department has to arrive at bloody, awful scenes all the time. And he was super calm, and, and you want that in a paramedic, right? Somebody who can be cool, cool and calm in the most horrific circumstances. And that was David, which really helps explain something about the cleaning up in the house, doesn't it? So, and then the other nickname was Killer, but that's because oh. it, it became obvious to pretty much everyone in Tucson, right? When I tell you this story, I mean, by this point, you're thinking, good grief, who else would have done this, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's what <clears throat> other people were thinking too. Um, so Rosemary comes forward in June of 07, and that leads to some really cool high-speed type of investigation as far as getting a wiretap. Now, the, the federal prosecutors get to deal with wiretaps a lot. As a, as a county DA, we're kind of underfunded and, and, and overworked, and we're, it's not often that we get to do something like a wiretap. But here the police got to tap into David Watson's phones, and they did it with a real good strategy, which was they first did a media blitz. And what, I'm gesturing to Kim here. They did a media blitz and said, we've got exciting new information in the Watson case. We can't tell you what it is. And the, and the TV news station, this was all, hyper, have you guys heard about this case before sure, today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was all over the news uh, back when it happened and things. Uh, and so the news covered in, in the fall of 2007, breaking news in the Watson case. Investigators say they have new information. While they tapped the phone and just tried to turn up the heat and see if he would say something. And sure enough, he said a lot of things. He said things like, uh, well, I could be going to jail soon. I, I don't, you never know what they'll find. They shouldn't find anything, but you never know. Uh, he called everybody he could who he was very close to and said, don't talk to the police. You don't have to tell them anything. Now, think about that, because if you're innocent, I would suggest to you that the cause would be, tell them everything you know, right? Um, so, and, and, and in the wire to, yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering if Rosemary is somewhere safe at this point in time. Great, great question. She talked vividly about her fear. She stopped parking in her carport for fear of getting ambushed. She had a real serious fear that he would find out she had gone to the police. The police were aware of that and they kept a close eye on her to the extent that they did 26 different interviews. And I'll say interview, they weren't interviews. They were trying, I mean, they did a few interviews with Rosemary, but they did a lot of meetings just to make sure she was okay and that they knew who she was talking to, if she was talking to anybody, like just making sure she was keeping it quiet, keeping everything on the down low. And at trial, of course, that became an attack on Rosemary. You gave 26 different statements to the police. I mean, to read them, it took me over a week to go through all of her statements and, and index them uh, because they, were, they filled an entire binder. You don't usually have that with a single witness. But yeah, they kept a close eye on her. She was scared. They were scared for her. But a lid was successfully kept on all of this, and David didn't know. He knew, he, on the wiretap, said, somebody's gone to the police. I don't know who it is. And they even discussed on the wiretap, well, do you think it's Rosemary? Nah, Rosemary's good. She's standing by me. Well, who do you think it is? Well, it could be this one friend who I took out there one time. Oh. Took out where? Well, so that's the thing is that he takes, as the pressure is turning up, he's literally talking to friends and he, he's big into horses. And he's talking to friends about, I think I might get arrested any day now. Just care for my, you know, because the police were going and talking to his friend. Another way of turning up the heat besides getting it out in the media that there's a break in the case is to talk to all of his friends so that they go back and tell him that they're all being interviewed. And so he would talk about this on the phone that he knew, you know, they're talking to all my friends. Um, they might arrest me at any time. So just care for my horses. And um, as he increasingly became concerned about being arrested on, uh, New Year's Eve of, of 2007, he takes a ride out by the Silver Bell Mine. Now, I want you to know something about that, about that ride. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip the, that is, um, that's Linda Watson's that's skull. Yeah. Linda Watson's skull, um, and this is, this is a little bit confusing mm -hmm. because it was found in 2003 by hunters in an area <laughs> out by the Silver Bell Mine, which is out of the end of Aver Valley Road, far mm -hmm. reaches of Marana. And, um, because of the location it was found, and this is a real sad part of life down here, is that there are so many undocumented border crossers 
who have died in, in our deserts and, and including in that area, that her skull was, was um, thought to be uh, an undocumented border crosser and it was put into the, a program run by Dr. Bruce Anderson, who's he's absolutely an a amazing guy and was a great witness at trial. Um, his, his program tries to identify the remains uh, so that you know they could have a little closure for the families in, in Mexico or the families of these people who, who lose their lives in the desert. The problem with that program is it's underfunded, as you can imagine. And so you're going to be mad when I tell you this, but we did not find out because of the delays it takes, how long it takes to find undocumented border crosser to identify them. We did not even know this was Linda's skull until 2011. So obviously more funding needed for those types of things. Yes, ma'am. What's the explanation for the missing bone? Oh, you know, that's a great question. The explanation for the missing bone. Um, Dr. Bruce Anderson is a, a, a forensic anthropologist, and he testified at trial, and he talked about what can happen to remains. And I don't want to um, gross anybody out or anything. And, and by the way, I've, I've spoken to... Um, Mar Linda's aunt, Marilyn's sister, and, and she's happy to know that I'm coming out here and talking with you all. And, and so, you know, the, with all due respect to, to Linda and, and the family, um, animals can, can, can dig up these remains. And they can, and it's a, it, Dr. Anderson testified at trial that coyotes have been known to carry skulls as far as five or even 10 miles. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. That's something the defense wanted to bring up to say, oh, she wasn't really found right where David Watson went and rode his horse at the time that the heat was being turned up, because that's what happened, is that well, they didn't know this in 2007. See, in 2007, they don't know where Linda is, but they know that David Watson goes and takes a horse ride. The, this, the red circle on the, um, the lower red circle is where he parked his, his truck and trailer for, for the horses. The upper red circle is where Linda was found. And this area, that's to put it in perspective, you see Tucson here to give you an idea of scale. I mean, this is right on top, within a mile. These two locations within a mile of each other. And actually he rode right over by where the skull was on that, on that trail because he was, he was uh, followed. So, so a really significant piece of evidence, but not understood at that time, right? Now, another thing that happens, we talked about interviews and interview techniques. Detective Paul Montano met with Luis's, uh, I'm sorry, with David Watson's friends, including a friend named Luis Arquides. And that was, he was kind of a, a drinking buddy of David. And he described an incident where David was super drunk. And by the way, David, when I say he was smart, he kept his mouth shut largely. But, what's that, 10 minutes? Oh my goodness. I got speed. We're only gonna be able to talk about one case today. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have the I have the uh, I have the other case. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you about it anytime. Yes. So 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 um, David's drinking buddy Luis Arquides says that sometime and he doesn't remember the exact year, 2005, 2007 time frame. He's drunk. David's drunk. They get in the car and David reaches over and feels him up to see if he's wearing a wire. And then, and, and, and when I, the reason I'm so admiring of this interview is because it took two hours to get Luis to tell, the friend, to tell Detective Montano that. Two hours of talking to Luis with Luis saying, I don't know nothing. Now, and there's an example of where if you say, well, I'll hook you up to a polygraph, you'll never get a single word out of Luis ever in your life. But instead, Detective Paul Montano, like the more bees with honey thing, he just, he just chatted with him about whatever. And two hours into the interview, he gets this thing about the wire. And he keeps going for another hour with Luis saying, I don't know anything more. I've told you everything I know. And then hour three, Luis Arquides tells him that he was present in a conversation where other people were present. And David Watson said, I can tell you exactly where Linda is. Um, and... Here's an audio clip of that. This is Luis. Well, you did say he could show me where she's at. Tell me about that. That was my time. He said to you? 
I don't know if he was just talking to me or me and Mike, but he said... Well, tell me that. Tell me, just tell me the story like I haven't heard it yet, dude. What was going on? Back to their conversation, whatever the fuck they were talking about, which I could care less. But I knew it was directed towards... The fuck's your name? <laughs> I knew it was directed towards her, the conversation. As he said, and he was drunk. And I go, what the fuck are you guys talking about? And he goes, I can show you where she's at. I said, well, I, show, I know exactly where she's at and I can show you. And I said, in the conversation, I was like, not this. You want to know anymore, huh? No. Would you? We thought we had figured out who was present for that conversation, and we called them. And they're, they're Dave's friends, and, you know, to varying degrees, they... They weren't particularly forthcoming, but we had uh, we had them trapped with little statements on the wiretap where they'd be on the phone with David and they'd say, hey, remember that time you talked about going out there and things like that. So we had pretty good statements to corroborate what his friend said. So, but in the end, what we really had, that was important, because think of it, trial is going to be defense attacking Rosemary and saying, she's lied. So she's a liar, so you can't believe her. And without Rosemary, you don't have enough to have a case. So how do you know to believe Rosemary? Well, it really comes down to Jordan. So Jordan was four years old and she was not with her mom when her mom was killed. So Jordan couldn't provide any insight about what happened to Linda. But Jordan was seven that night that Watson went to the union meeting, the night Marilyn and Renee were gunned down, seven years old. And she was taken to a safe child interview the very next day after the murders. Now, um, a child forensic interview is, is conducted down at the Child Advocacy Center, and it's done by a forensic interviewer who's been trained not to lead kids. So you can't ask kids leading questions, right? Uh, because they're, they're, they can be suggestible. Little Jordan had already had things suggested to her. In her forensic interview, she was driven there by her father. Uh -huh. And she shows up in the forensic interview, and when they say, all right, tell us what happened, and she says, well, my dad was home. Well, how'd you know your dad was home? Because he told me. <laughs> oh, okay, well, tell me more about this, because, you know, you can't lead. You can't say, oh, did he tell you? So, so here's the interview, and that's, I, tr I try to let you know that, because you'll see the interviewer is kind of asking roundabout type of questions. <laughs> it was night. It was night. Okay. When you came home, and your mom let you in, did you ask her, you know, is dad here or what? Uh-oh. Little technical problem. So, so what happens in this clip is that... Uh, it was nice. Oh, there we go. Okay. When you came home and your mom let you in, did you ask her, you know, is dad here or what? What, what we got to play it at court. I didn't have tech problems then. As, who was I talking to? There's always tech problems. Yeah, me. Uh, t what they, what, what, and isn't Jordan adorable? She's seven years old. Her feet, her feet don't even hit the, hit the floor on the, when she's sitting in that big chair at the forensic interview. But she says, I came home. At, well, first she says, uh, who was home? Well, daddy was home. How do you know? Because he told me. All right, well, tell me about coming home. Well, I came home, and I said to Mommy, is Daddy still at his meeting? And oh. Mommy said, I don't know. So a couple different times in the interview, she makes it clear that she did not see her father until he came in to kiss her goodnight, which is exactly what Rosemary had said. And so that was like a little time capsule left for us from Jordan, who testified at trial. That's um, a, a photograph from, from trial. And... and and here's the thing is that to know about how heartbreaking this kind of work is, is Jordan sat on the, her father's side of the courtroom. Jordan didn't know her mom. Her mom was killed when she was four. She doesn't know what happened, and she does not want to believe that her father did any of this. And she was most supportive of her father. She, however, to her credit, testified at trial and seemingly told the truth because she admitted, I can't remember the forensic interview which then allowed us to play it, okay? And so the jury saw the forensic interview, and, and it's heartbreaking, to, to obviously, to, to, to have to put Jordan on the witness stand at trial. 
And there's a picture of Rosemary, obviously the key witness at trial. She was on the witness stand for three days. And actually, uh, let me mention, we tried this case twice. So it was eight week trial. We tried it once and hung. Uh, uh, the jury could not agree unanimously. And so we tried it again in 2017 and won. Um, eight weeks long, more witnesses and more exhibits than the O.J. Simpson case. It was a biggie, folks. I mean, it really um, absolutely pushes you to the limit um, to, to, to try a case like that. And, and I don't want to pick on the news. I know we have, um, I, I'm a huge Kim Smith fan, but, but this is an example. You can't believe everything you see on TV, right? So here's a, a screenshot from the reporting on the case. Uh, David Watson convicted first degree murder Linda no second degree murder Linda first degree murder Marilyn and Renee okay and he's serving life terms and I think I'm near the end of my time but I want to play you one clip because I think you might all ask in the bio we talked about climbing rocks what does climbing rocks have to do with any of this I think now you can see going through one of these stories and if we went through more I think you'd really start to see you got to have an outlet you got to have something else that you're doing to keep you sane. So, so here's a little clip from the Dateline on this. And I think you can still find the Dateline episode on the Watson case online. I hope that's not too loud. Pima County Prosecutor Jonathan Mosier spends his weekends about as far away from a courtroom as one can get. I need a way to get it out of my head. Rock climbing, you have to be completely focused in the moment, not worried about you, yourself, your life, or any, all the chatter in your head. And it's liberating. It just scratches an itch that I need to be able to go back and do the next case. And there were few cases as daunting as the one he took on in 2014. The defendant, Tucson Fire Captain David Watson, accused of killing three women. This is the pinnacle for a prosecutor to take a challenge, make the challenge almost insurmountable, make it big, and overcome it. Sorry, we had a little tech problem with the video being synced, but I just wanted you guys to see that. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I maintain my sanity um, while I'm doing this work. I'll talk to you about the K. Reed case sometime, but. Uh, yes. Thank, thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.